So we just finished talking about things that help control our movement. So we talked about your cortex, your motor cortex. We talked about your cerebellum. We talked about your basal ganglia. Damages in these areas can cause movement disorders. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of movement disorders and when you describe a movement disorder to a clinician, you have to be very direct or very descriptive, otherwise it can mean anything. So you can have things like athetosis, which is kind of like this finger writhing. If you're curious, always just YouTube it. They have great examples, so athetosis. Those are right fingers. You can have chorea, which is kind of this fluid dance-like motion. Chorea. You can have tremors. Now there are many different types of tremors. You can have resting tremor where when you're just resting, you have this tremor. You can have tremors where you're, when you're trying to point to something that gets worse with motion or activity. You can have familiar tremor, just essential tremor where you just basically have a tremor and you're just kind of born with it. A lot of these people, I just read essential, will try and self-medicate with alcohol. If you pick this up, then you kind of want to switch them from alcohol to something more medical, something safer. We usually give them beta blockers. Non-selective, things like propanolol. Okay, so that's tremors. You can have hemibalismus. So hemibalismus. Balis, balis means to throw. So you have one side just throwing out. So I'll just write one, so I'll just write limb flinging. And it's, and it's often associated with damage to your subthalamic nucleus. Recall, recall that's your main excitatory part of your basal ganglia. If you can remember it's the main excitatory part of your basal ganglia, you can memorize the, the limb flinging. I think that's a pretty easy association. They might get really tricky and say, is it ipsilateral or contralateral? Lesions cause contralateral flinging. So a right lesion will cause a left attack. Okay? So you can have all these things when you have damage to your areas that control your movement. Now let's talk about some specific diseases or disorders. The big one is Parkinson's. Parkinson's is when your dopamine producing neurons in your basal ganglia die. What area of your basal ganglia produces dopamine? We just went over this. Hopefully you remember, that's your substantial nigra. And when they start to die, they start to depigment. So if you have a picture, you'll see this kind of dark substantia nigra and they die, they lose that dark line. So I write depigment. So you can pick that up grossly. And when your substantial nigra dies, then you don't have dopamine. We said dopamine was the main neurotransmitter that initiated and stopped movement. So you're gonna have all types of movement disorders, right? So when I wanna say movement disorders, you kinda of know it's Parkinson's. It's part, you know it's movement disorders. You're gonna have things like resting tremors, tremor, rigidity, shuffling gait, or kind of trouble taking that first step and kind of having trouble stopping because your dopamine is all off. And then one thing you should know, um, dopamine and acetylcholine kind of exist in equilibrium. So if you have low dopamine, then acetylcholine rises. If you have low acetylcholine, then dopamine rises. So, so the things you can find neurotransmitter wise will obviously be decreased dopamine, but you also see increased acetylcholine just from that imbalance. Now what caused this in the first place? When, when we biopsy the brain, we found all these weird protein deposits called Lewy bodies. These protein deposits were made out of alpha synuclein, which is a normal protein in our brain, but somehow it just went awry and started depositing and destroying our substantia nigra. Another thing that can cause Parkinson's is this illicit drug called MPTP. This was a, a designer drug, a synthetic drug. So when some people started taking it and then it destroyed your substantia nigra. And so people were 20 years old and they had acute Parkinson's. And then when they died and they looked in the brain, they saw your substantial nigra was basically destroyed. And this is from this illicit drug. So if it's a young patient coming in from taking a drug and they're having all these signs of acute Parkinson's, MPTP, seen a few questions on it. Very unfortunate, there was like this wave, this epidemic of MPTP it had a subsequent wave of people with Parkinson's, young people with Parkinson's. So don't take rando drugs, okay? So MPTP is a big one. You can also have Parkinson's from, you can also have drug-induced Parkinson's, drug-induced. 
These are drugs that block dopamine. Why would we ever want to block dopamine? We just said how important dopamine is. Dopamine does a lot of things in different places. Um, dopamine in your mesocortical pathway causes schizophrenia or schizophrenia signs, so hallucinations, uh, delusions, all that stuff. And so if we have a patient with schizophrenia, we want to block that dopamine, so we'll lower that dopamine. Unfortunately, it's not very specific, and a lower dopamine in our basal ganglia also and cause Parkinson's. So be, be very, very careful. They give you a question about a young patient that's having his, a history of psychiatric disorders, schizophrenia, delusions, disorganized speech, etc., etc., the whole nine yards. And they, they're given a drug, and then all of a sudden they have tremors, instant gait, all that stuff. They don't have Parkinson's. They have drug-induced Parkinson's signs. Okay, so, so the question stem will be very, very obvious for it, as long as you're looking out for it. All right. Last thing you should know, Parkinson's, once it deposits in your substantial neck, it can also destroy other areas of your brain and cause eventual dementia. Dementia comes a little later. The movement disorders come first, but dementia goes together with Parkinson's. There's no cure for Parkinson's, unfortunately. However, we can give drugs that kind of reduce its effects. How do you think we do that? Well, if it's a problem with decreased dopamine, what do you think we'll do? We'll increase dopamine. And to raise dopamine, to understand the drugs of Parkinson's, we have to understand dopamine. We have to kind of know our enemy. All right, so let's just go through the mechanism of dopamine. We can't give dopamine straight up. We can't just inject it in our body because dopamine is ionized. It won't cross the blood-brain barrier where we need it the most. So instead, we give something called L-DOPA. And that goes in our body, and we're hoping they'll be able to cross the blood-brain barrier and go to our brain, where we have all these dopamine receptors, just waiting for dopamine. Dopamine receptors. That is our hope, our prayer. And unfortunately, going from L-DOPA to our dopamine receptor is a very treacherous journey. As soon as you give L-DOPA in our body, it'll immediately get degraded by COMT. Which is, which is catechol-methyltransferase, which just degrades L-DOPA, turns it into something called 3-OMD, which is a byproduct. Some of it will survive and become dopamine. Be it an enzyme, be it an enzyme DOPA decarboxylase, or DDC. That doesn't do us any good. Becoming dopamine in our peripheries doesn't do us any good. We need dopamine to cross the blood-brain barrier. So, very, so a very small amount, after it's been through all these other processes, we'll finally be able to cross that blood-brain barrier. All right, now we have L-DOPA in our brain. And some of it finally gets converted into dopamine via DDC. So dopamine. And that goes into our synapses and COMT will rear its ugly head again when we'll try and degrade some of the dopamine. We call it COMT because we call this COMT central because it's central in the brain. Another thing that can de degrade it is MAO B or monoamine oxidase B. And that turns it into DOPAC. A lot of things degrade it. But a small amount will finally make it through. Like I said, it's a very, very treacherous journey. So a very small amount will be able to make it through. And you release it to your synapses, it hits your receptors, you get dopamine, all is well. And so that is the mechanism of dopamine. Now that we know our enemies, we can find ways to kind of manipulate it. Yeah, find ways to increase that dopamine, a small amount of dopamine, make it a little bit more. I can think of a way. How about we just give more L-DOPA? We call that levodopa. And some side effects of level dopa, you can have on and off effect. On and off where they're either doing well or they're doing terrible. And the reason for that is you're either taking the drug and getting dopamine or you're not taking the drug and not getting dopamine. So you get this on off effect. We say that increased dopamine in other pathways like the mesocortical pathways can cause psychosis, psychotic symptoms. This one's no different, so you can have psychosis. Dopamine, if you recall from my biochem, hopefully you watch my biochem videos, dopamine becomes norepi and epi. So this conversion can cause arrhythmias. From norepi and epi. All right, so that's one thing we can do. How about blocking these two pathways? 
Wouldn't that be a good idea? We can block COMT, peripherally, by things called into Capone and Talk Capone. These are COMT blockers. We can block peripheral DDC. And this will be Carbidopa. One of the most common drug combinations is giving Levodopa or Carbidopa. By giving Levodopa or Carbidopa, we kind of increase the chances of it going into our blood brain barrier. All right, so let's move on down to the blood brain barrier. Again, COMT rears its ugly head, so we can give blockers for central COMT. Fortunately for us, Tolcapone can actually cross the blood brain barrier and we can use that. So it blocks both. Enticapone can't, so it's kind of stuck there in the peripheries. How about Mal B? We can block Mal B with things like Selegiline and Rosalgiline. Some side effects you should know. That increased dopamine can again cause changes to norepi and epi. You can have hypertensive crisis, so I was right, hypertensive crisis. And also, selegiline can, can affect drug testing and cause positive amphetamine drug screen, so be careful of that. All right, so we blocked these nasty, nasty things that degrade our dopamine, and we're able to release more. There's a drug that helps this release and stops this reuptake, and it's not what you suspect. It's amantadine. Isn't that the antiviral? Yes, it is. How it does this, no one's really sure, but hey, we're not complaining. So it can increase release and decrease the reuptake, which just means more dopamine in the synapse. Some side effects, it can cause small, small blood clots in your capillaries. Again, I'm not really sure of the mechanism, but it will turn your color, turn the color of your skin red because of this. It's clots, we call that. I should have been right on the side. It's hard to read. I mean, my handwriting is hard to read it anyways, but make it even worse. We call that Levito Reticularis. All right, and then the last step, hitting these dopamine receptors. We, we can give dopamine agonists, so things that bind on these receptors. And these can come from ergot derivatives, fungi derivatives, like bromocryptine. You might have heard of bromocryptine before when we're talking about endocrine, so things like, things like hyperprolactinemia. You can give non-ergot, non-fungal derivatives like pramipexol, and this is probably more preferred, but usually not one of the first line drugs we give for Parkinson's. And that is Parkinson's, that is the pharmacology of Parkinson's. Hope that, hope that clears things up. Whenever you're doing farm, always have the mechanism, and then it's very easy to understand the drugs because you can just kind of list, oh, it, does, it works here and it does this. It's very easy to visualize. All right, so that's Parkinson's. Another big one is gonna be Huntington's. Huntington's is an inherited disorder that absolutely destroys your striatum, mainly your caudate nucleus. So if we draw our basal ganglia again, so this is your caudate. This was your putamen. Globus pallidus externa and interna, subthalamic nucleus, and then your substantia nigra. So it can destroy your caudate. Huntington, destroy your caudate. And you'll see this grossly if you ever see a specimen of this brain. It's basically this, this cavity where it used to be. And like anything, other things will take its place, namely your ventricles. So your ventricles will kind of take its place. Ventricle, ventriculomegaly. And when it destroys your caudate, it destroys these GABA releasing neurons and these ACH releasing neurons. So I'll just write decrease. And we said that ACH and, and dopamine are kind of in flux. So when you have lowered ACH, what will, you, what will we see on dopamine? Well, you see increased dopamine. And also, when you have decreased GABA inhibitory, you have increased glutamate as excitatory. And that's exactly what you see, excitatory glutamate. And too much, yeah, and you can have too much of a good thing. Too much excitatory um, stimulation is neurotoxic. So you basically damage your brain even further. The increased excitatory will also show the signs of Huntington. So chorea, chorea, they might show signs of aggression. So what causes this in the first place? Well, it's a trinucleotide repeat disorder. 
mainly CAG. And it's 100, and it affects your chromosome 4, so you have all these CAG repeats, repeats on your chromosome 4, and it causes this disorder. And there's a 100% penetrance, which means if you have the disorder, you're going to show it. Anytime you have a trinucleotide repeat, first off, know it because it's only like 4. So you have to know it's due to CAG, and also they have any trinucleotide repeats has something called anticipation. If you have a child, they're going to have more CAG repeats, and they're going to have a more severe disease that presents sooner. And if that child has a child, then they can anticipate that that, that that grandkid would have more repeats, would have more severe disease, have it sooner. And if that kid has a kid, then again, the cycle goes on and on. We call that anticipation. So it's very important that you screen for depression, suicide. Because you can imagine if you have this and you really want a kid, you don't want to give your kid this. You know you're going to give your kid this. So. A lot of these patients unfortunately commit suicide or fall into a deep depression. That's Huntington's, unfortunately like Parkinson's, there's no cure, so alright, no cure. You can have drugs that reduce the symptoms mildly. What are we going to try and do here? Well, we have low GABA and low ACH and we have high dopamine and high glutamine. One of the things we can do is work on this dopamine. The drugs we use will kind of work on dopamine, kind of reduce dopamine. And these drugs are reserpine and tetrabenzapine. It stops the release and the reuptake. All right, so that way we can reduce dopamine. And the last movement disorder I want to talk about today is Friedrich ataxia. This is another trinucleotide repeat. This time it's on chromosome nine, and instead of being CAG, it's GAA. It codes for something called frataxin. You absolutely need to know it codes for something called frataxin. Frataxin helps your mitochondria regulate iron. So right, mitochondria, iron. Iron is a great thing, but iron is also a free radical. If you can't regulate it, you have too much iron, you have free radicals, and you basically destroy your mitochondria. Because we're talking about it in terms of movement disorder, you know it's gonna affect your cerebellum. So you're gonna have things like So you're gonna have things like staggering gait, trouble movement, trouble with movement. It can affect your spinal cord and spine. So you can have kyphoscoliosis. That is a big giveaway. Kyph Kyphosis meaning hunchback, scoliosis meaning the S spine. So you have both. But if you think it only affects these areas, then that that's impossible. It affects your, all your mitochondria. So it affects everything you only kind of see these because they're they're very evident outwardly but it can affect your internal structures too it can affect your pancreas you get diabetes because your beta cells are destroyed it can affect your heart you get hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in fact that's the most common way they die it's the most common cause of death and that is friedrich ataxia that is movement disorders Hope that cleared it up. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.